So I'd like to invite on our virtual stage here four presenters. And I don't know if you're really presenting as with four or if there's not all four, but it's um, at least a presentation by Lita uh, Crociani. I'm not sure I pronounced that right. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Windland from UV Bristol. Then we have um, Jonathan Mosley, also from UV Bristol and from the artist practice together with Sophie Warren, uh, Warren and Mosley. And then we also have Nigel Williams, also from UV Bristol. And the presentation is titled Architecture on the Couch, Exploring the Psychology of the Architectural Assemblage as a Radical Reconceptualization of How It May Be Sustained. Right. Thank you, Torsten. And just to say that uh, I think Lita and I will be presenting the paper, and uh, Sophie unfortunately couldn't be here, um, but she sends her regards to the conference, and I think Nigel's here, and he can be involved in maybe some of the questions, uh, responding to some of the questions. Um, it's great. So can you share, see my screen okay? Yep. Yes, excellent. Thank you. Okay, great. So, um, this paper introduces the research project, Architecture on the Couch, the Psychology of Buildings. We wanted to radically reconceptualize architecture as a psychological and psychosocial sub subject. Um, through transdisciplinary dialogue, uh, the conceptual artist Sophie Warren, then with a psychodynamic therapist, Nigel Williams, psychosocial researcher, uh, Lita Christiani, Windland, and uh, myself, are retuning methods derived from so psychosocial studies, also from psychoanalysis and conceptual art. And this is really to explore the consciousness and unconsciousness of architecture. Our starting point for a psychology of buildings is that architecture is not only building. The project considers architecture as an assemblage of human and non-human qualities, materialities, immaterialities, conscious and unconscious impacts. Referencing Delanda from 2006, in this complex relational entanglement, each entity has the power to affect the other. These effects vary with a range of resulting impacts from widespread occupant sickness and obsolescence of a building to enhance well-being of all inhabitants and the sustaining of the architecture. So in a context of rapidly changing climate, the global pandemic, and shifting cultural, technological, social, economic, and political trends, effective forces within architecture are constantly at play as the aspirations for and the pressures on buildings and their systems and their occupants evolve. So most architecture is, is pretty much continually in danger of becoming redundant, disposable, or consumed. In order that architecture be sustained, its assemblage has to mutate in order that we understand how the, how the assemblage should mutate through design or through repurposing or built intervention or modes of occupation or just ways of thinking, we must first really understand its internal relational dynamics. So our framing identifies a number of foundational attributes. One, a building is the product and expression of a web of relationships comprising human and non-human aspects. In that sense, it is relational both in the way it comes into being and in the way it is used and related to. Number two, a building is an entity of time with a personal history of people and events. It can be said that a building is a condensed expression of time into space. Three, a building speaks through its body and its language is mostly, though not exclusively, visual and spatial. Number four, a building is subject to power and has power to affect. Humans clearly have power over buildings in their design, use and maintenance, but humans are also affected by the building itself, its ease of use for the functions people are required to perform within it, the ambience or atmosphere they're in is able to influence people's well-being and productivity. And finally, in that sense, number five, a building partakes of unconscious qualities because there are impacts of unconscious decisions embedded in the design management of the architecture 
and because of its ability in turn to affect the unconscious of the occupants. This thinking resonates with Timothy Morton's understanding of ecological thought as the, and I quote, the thinking of inter interconnectedness. Morton uses the concept of a mesh to refer to the interdependence and interconnectedness of all living and non-living things. This also chimes with notions of entanglement, which originating in quantum physics is being increasingly applied to cultural theory and practice. Doug Jackson writes, and I quote, instead of being distinct from the environment, we are fundamentally entangled with it. And the lack of objectivity that this entanglement implies means that the way out of the current climate catastrophe cannot only be through measurement and calculation, but must also come from the speculation and invention of alternative forms of engagement. We must finally recognize that the environmental crisis is also a crisis of the imagination. Architecture's unique spatial and aesthetic expertise can therefore be enlisted to stage other environmental performances, ones that stimulate the environmental imaginary and sponsor valuable new ideas about the environment and new forms of engagement with it. Our framing identifies a number of foundational, in, uh, sorry, I, I got myself uh, onto the wrong page. Um, so given our ontological premises and interest in a complex entangled subjectivity of buildings, a way of anchoring such complexity is to take a case study approach, which includes a building's location history, the history of those who commissioned it and used it over time, its aesthetic and material qualities, and changes of use over time into the present moment. So the Communist Party headquarters known as La Siege, designed by Oscar Niemeyer, built between 1966 and 1980, has been the focus of a test case. The following gives a very brief outline of methods and findings examples of what the methodology has uncovered. A genealogical approach was taken in the form of a family tree and an event line, mapping the web of influences and relationships from the history and choice of site to the choice of architect, design, construction, and uses of the building after 2020. And the image is of stamps issued to party members in exchange for funds contributed towards the cost of the building. And it could tell us much more about the imaginings of the Communist Party at that time. The family tree that we created is, is speculative and conjures liaisons between human and non-human entities that produce other entities, encompassing around 50 in number and over nine generations of family in verticals. For example, uh, in the family tree, Le Corbusier and the hills of Rio had a liaison during an influential visit for the architect to the area. The liaison then produced the young Oscar Neymar. In the family tree, the, the, the headquarters has a lineage back to the Brazilian anthro Anthropophago movement that referent, referenced the cannibalistic Tupi tribe in Brazil in devouring European culture to produce a new Brazilian culture, and to the surrealists in Paris who were connected to the Communist Party. Um, the image here is of uh, the surrealist poet, poet Louis Aragon's memorial at the headquarters. So in, although speculative, in creating a family, the entities and relations of the family tree are based on multiple interviews, including with project architect Jean de Roche and extensive desktop research. The entanglement of social history, including the specific history of the Communist Party, along with aspects more specific to the design and construction of a building, were collated into an event timeline and thematically analyzed. The findings from desktop and interview research were then triangulated by an innovative psychosocial method known as visual matrix, whereby the images of the building were presented to a group of people with experience of free associative work and psychosocial methods, but who had no prior knowledge of which building they would be presented with. We tested the possibility that a stand-in for the building could be part of a series of psychotherapeutic sessions to further unearth unconscious aspects of the building subjectivity, 
this method properly embodied the title of the research in that it put architecture on the couch. The stand-in role was also taken up separately by the two investigators with prior knowledge of the building acquired through three months in the building as artists, researchers in residence. They were funded by the British Council, Arts Council and Institut Francais, and their involvement with the drawing up of the family tree and timeline event of events was crucial. The psychotherapy sessions were conducted by an experienced therapist, Nigel, also active academically in the field of psychosocial studies. Psychological issues and blind spots or unknown knowns that arose included a strong cult of personality within the architectural assemblage over many years and a migrant and hybrid identity. More recently, also a split in identity between the building as a party headquarter called La Maison de, by the Comrades and the same building marketed as a sparse Nimea constituting spaces for hire, for fashion shoots, music videos, corporate entertaining and cultural media events. But unfortunately, there is not enough time to go into substantiation of these conclusions here. Extending psychologist Winnicott's concept of a transitional object, for example, a cot for a baby that stands in for the mother's or father's embracing arms, we are developing what we refer to as a series of deputized objects that act as stand-ins for the mute forms of buildings within therapy sessions. So they're employed and held by the person or the group undergoing therapy. These are not literal models of the architecture, but express some of the formal identities and schisms of the building under study. And these are being fabricated with the help of Jose Conejo and specialist fabricators, Jack the Maker. So alongside these deputized objects, I just lost my place. Uh, it's, it's the problems of administering slides and word file at the same time. Alongside the testing of a particular psychosocial set of methodological tools, we created a toolkit outlining the variety of tools, some of which we tested out, which we could consider suitable to a psychology of buildings. Our aim now is to operationalize this further by application to other case study buildings and to develop a psychosocial architectural consultancy model alongside academic research and exhibitable art practice outcomes. We seek a deep understanding of the assemblage of architecture and the interrelations and interdependent dynamics of built elements, occupiers, systems, objects and behaviours. With this knowledge, it's then possible to propose shifts in ways spaces are occupied or organized, or, or the ways that the building is perceived and operated, which will render a healthier psychology for the assemblage as a whole. And this will enhance well-being of users without significant architectural interventions or major remodeling of the building, and thereby expend minimal material and energy resources. Um, we would be interested to hear of any particularly sick or distressed buildings that may benefit from our attentions from the audience today. Thank you very much. This is part of a wider project that we're embarking on uh, from December uh, this year, but is part of a much wider trajectory of mine and others, an interest in energy behavior and socio-spatial entanglements within that. Um, so as I'm currently mainly helping chairing uh, sessions and overall conference, I'm really happy to pass on to my colleagues, Anna Shatsimihali, who will uh, start sharing her screen with Lydia Badarna, and um, give a bit, little bit of an insight into the project, what we're trying to achieve, and a bit of a game uh, that I'm hoping has um, been able to work. Um, Merat has worked really hard to get the game to work, which will start to engage you into this social spatial entanglement with your energy use in your everyday morning routine in your homes. Uh, so I'll pass on to Anna, uh, if you're here, and uh, let you share your screen. So, hi all, my name is uh, Anna Hatzimichardli, and today we are presenting our work entitled Socio-Spatial Ambient Technology Encounters, Your Home to Mine. Uh, as, next slide, please. 
Uh, as Sonia mentioned, this is part of a large project where we are looking into optimizing energy management behaviors using B colony management insights. And uh, the project is a collaboration between UE Bristol and University of Bristol and three uh, energy housing communities, low energy housing communities are joining us also as partner. The project is entitled GLOW which stands for energy nested biosystem flows from the home to the hub and comprises four large work packages. So we are starting, the first work package is the um, yellow uh, dot at the center of the screen, where we're starting by collecting data and trying to understand socio-technical aspects of human energy behavior in humans. Then we move into the second work package, which we dive into social insects and specifically bees, where we're trying to understand their logic and how they behave and manage their resources. Both those work packages then fit into the computational aspect where we're building a bio-inspired computational system to optimize energy management. And finally, we want to validate everything using citizen juries and participatory design to test our approach. Next slide, please. Now, today we would like to invite you to a game and we would like to tell us a bit more about your morning routine as part of this project because every routine is different and morning routines are very much energy intensive, but they're massively understudied. We want to see if we can draw some insights from the audience here today in, um, in, a, in a live experiment, actually. Uh, so next slide, please. But why does this matter? Why, why do we actually do this work? Now, energy behavior is a very complex area where interdependent aspects of social, spatial, physical, but also digital elements play a role. Now, currently, energy, um, home energy management, uh, the home energy management literature ignores the interdependencies of all those aspects and uh, overlooks the way that humans actually live. Energy, the Energy is a top-down system where the network is enforcing how the ways that we, we can use it. So uh, energy as an ecosystem is, is, is a service and every service needs to, uh, we need to co-create with the service to create value. So this is the first study which is actually looking social elements and spatial elements at the individual household but also at the collective. Next slide, please. Now, at the moment we have some community led platforms, but they mainly concentrate on trading energy with the network. So the individual doesn't play a role on those um, scenarios. And also we have the other part of the literature is smart energy devices, which is gets um, growing interest from um, both the market and academics. But those technologies considered the house or the individual as a void without any relationship between one individual household with the other. So are, they are ignoring all aspects of the community. And also most of that literature is also ignoring the spatial element of uh, the household. And um, so how are we going to approach all this? And at this stage, I want to invite my colleague, Dr. Lydia Bardana, who is going to talk about biomimicry and how we might be able to use intelligence and logic from social animals to solve this problem. Yeah, thank you, Anna. <laughs> yeah, so social uh, insects live in colonies where simple cues, mostly chemicals, regulate how colonies forage, maintain their nests, and uh, reproduce. A species with a highly developed social structure are called eusocial and characterized by self-organization and emergence. Ants, bees, and wasps um, are examples for eusocial uh, colonies exhibiting coordinated social behaviors where local 
rules of interaction at the lower level can cause a global pattern in the system. So it's the, the connection with the individual and the collective with household. And through biomimicry, we can focus on the collective intelligence and self-organization of uh, social uh, colonies to learn how they interact with their surroundings and define effective behavioral patterns, communication systems, feedback loops, influence uh, of uh, external internal uh, stimuli and other aspects. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, where do bees come in? Uh, bees have a highly <clears throat> structured and hierarchical social organization that responds uh, to changing conditions uh, where bees can provide a useful lens into understanding the interconnectedness between individual behavior and con community resource needs. And uh, through evolution, they have developed this uh, special dance. It's called the Wuggle Dance, where um, one of the bees that uh, informs the colony about the location of the food source uh, in relation to sun and the, and the beehive, um, where the dance can define the, the distance and also the angle that they have to take in order to get to the uh, food source. And they also communicate the, um, how, how, how uh, profitable is that also food source. And in the context of targeted household energy management, there are foreseen in efficiencies that social insects uh, can resolve them efficiently. And we aim to understand these interrelated spatial, social, environmental models from uh, uh, bees and develop new algorithms that can be applied in household energy management. So um, biomedics and computation design usually go hand in hand. For example, the game that I'm going to show, and I'm just going to click and send the link to that. <coughs> For example, the game that I'm going to show uses a simple swarm behavior to visualize the collected data through a simple multi-index weighted algorithm. So currently, GLOW is at the very early stage of data collection phase, trying to understand the socio parameters of house energy management. Once we gain an understanding, um, a deeper understanding of that, we can then look at biomimicry logic and try to recalibrate the algorithm. That part that is between um, the data and the visualization. It's a complex place, um, which we intend to look at closer. Um, the game that I'm going to show, there are some lessons learned from the game, plus the nature of doing a conference in COVID. Um, we have managed to establish an anonymous web-based method to collect the data. That means we don't, do not have to spend hours and hours interviewing 300 plus homeowners. Um, they can just send us their information um, that gives us a more comprehensive set of data um, at their convenience. Uh, we hope to learn from today um, through this very simple test, um, your thoughts on the interaction with this interface, if given real time information and real community data, would you be inclined to adjust your routine? So in today's game, we are interested to understand what your morning routine is. Behavioral patterns are based on your approaches, activities, and energy use. So the link that I just sent takes you to a temporary uh, place where we hosted this game on my website. Um, on the right, you'll see the game instructions. On the left, you'll see that there are panels, but actually these are three panels on top. So if you click on the top uh, part of the panel, you can drag them and spread them out. You can also double click on them and collapse them and non-collapse them. Before we do anything, the dots that are bouncing around in here are already entries in the database. And as you add and everybody adds onto it, they'll start having new points coming in. Uh, before you add anything, I would recommend you know, starting out with your information, for example, the age, uh, I'm not that old, uh, full-time, number of occupancy, average age, do, I, do you routinely conserve uh, energy? I'm um, mostly, yes. Uh, are you concerned? Yes. Do you invest occasionally? 
Um, and then the morning routine is more of your, um, um, just your routine. And so you'll see on the uh, X, on the Y axis, that all that information distributes itself on the Y axis, which are their social parameters. But also you can add maybe a rural, I don't know, age of the house, masonry, all that, right? So I'm gonna go with a couple of Souths and a couple of North and an open cat, and I do some energy management. And so once I've done that, I will do all of them. And then if you click anywhere in here and press Z, you'll see now that that dot is you. So that's me. Somebody just added someone and came in. So in your information, this actually changes in real time. So then what you could try to figure out then is how you are in position across the X and Y axis. So then you could say, am I part time? What will that change? And you'll see the, the percentage changed. Um, I occasionally invest if I do invest that will change my percentage. The age of the house will then start changing the percentage. And so once you've done that one, um, you can press Z and play again and try playing. And so that adds your entry. And if you log on or refresh your page, you cannot, you, you, that entry will be on the database. It's anonymous. So, um, and it's, it's essentially a game. So play around, see your energy efficiencies if you know them. Are they all A, for example? So then that starts changing. My morning routine yeah. keeps changing, should change. Anyway, so please, you can start seeing people. People are starting to, to come into the session. You can start seeing them play around. Um, so I guess that is me. I can stop sharing now. Um, thank you for your participation and listening. Thank you, Mayak. Just one thing to add, which I think um, is, is something we're trying to get out of this. Energy behaviour in homes has been studied a lot. Um, and the majority of that work is focused on the technical. And through participating in this game, we can learn a bit more about the social and the spatial setup and how that interacts or not with uh, home energy management technology use. So if you do have time to engage now, it would be great. If not, I'll post the link um, and you can engage in your own time. It would help our research a lot. Thank you. I would first like to acknowledge that here in Chicago, um, uh, we are located on the traditional homelands of the indigenous people and nations of the Council of the Three Fires, the Adawa, Ojibwe and Potawatomi nations as well as the Miami, Ho-Chunk, Sauk, and Fox, the Kikapo, Peoria, and Sioux Nations. Uh, we pay our respect to the land, the elders, and the people, their past, present, and future leaders, and our work is indebted to their example of land stewardship. I also want to acknowledge and thank the conference organizers um, for um, presenting the challenge of, of presenting the work in eight minutes. Um, my strategy will be to um, make two points. Um, the second point I will make um, is that um, for us in Blacks and Green, environmental justice is a liberatory practice. And I'll end our presentation with a brief description of, description of that. The, second, the first thing I will do, though, is um, point and give a framework for um, understanding um, the practice of urban design in a place like Chicago through the lens of um, the Black radical tradition. Um, Chicago, as a white colonial settler city, first appeared as an abstraction. Um, the city was platted um, with a, a grid that became the instrument of real estate speculation um, in 1830 and um, existed as an instrument of real estate speculation before anything was built. This 
these abstract instruments of um, understanding and possession um, that catalog characterized um, the white settler traditions that um, built Chicago in the 19th century um, also became um, the tools of architects and planners and policy analysts. This is the very same tools that allowed Chicago to become the laboratory for racial segregation in the US. I won't go through this history at all um, in detail, but I will um, use the, these instruments, these abstract instruments, these architects and sociologists' um, drawings as a way of um, sort of understanding the differences between um, the practices of uh, white supremacy in a city like Chicago and uh, the promise of the black radical tradition in the same city. I'll specifically point to, um, I want to start with the work of W.E.B. Du Bois, um, the, um, uh, the sociologist and uh, political activist uh, who um, tried to um, reinvent um, or try to instigate a project of reinventing both um, African American communities and the American democracy um, throughout the latter half of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. One of his projects um, done in relationship with a series of historically black universities and schools was a series of studies of the progress of the what he described as um, African American. Here we see some of the maps and um, diagrams that he um, presented in the uh, uh, Paris exhibition of 1900. One of his assistants in this project was Robert Park, a white American sociologist who became instrumental in the establishment of sociology as an academic discipline in uh, US universities. He and his partner, um, Burgess, in Chicago, would um, publish the kind of uh, foundational um, uh, textbooks on the study of cities and sociology in the US. Here we see his ecology of a Midwestern city um, taken directly from this, from Chicago, uh, published in 1925. And here you see a kind of anomaly in this sort of model of concentric development, um, carefully zoned into um, various economic and social groups. This anomaly is something called the Black Belt which was the only part of the city that African-Americans were allowed to live legally uh, throughout most, a big, throughout a substantial part of the 20th century. This work obviously owed its um, aesthetic and its, uh, its um, process to the work established by Du Bois, but actually had a slightly different agenda. As part of the sort of longer educational project and the um, process of analysis that um, fed directly into um, the abstract instruments of social control that would, would uh, enact um, black and white segregation in cities like Chicago, um, the sort of paradoxical reality of the, this this, bold, this academic project meant that their work became instruments for people who sought to directly continue um, the idea of advancing a kind of liberatory and transformational um, uh, approach to understanding the American city and to understanding this thing called the Black Belt. Here you see on the left, um, the Park and Burgess model of the American city in um, 1925, and then a later work by Drake and Caton, 
um, to black students of Park and Burgess in 1945. Here you see a slightly different articulation of that zone of the city, um, which they named the black metropolis, a zone that was both larger, more precise in its articulation, and something which kind of very precisely interrupted this abstract model of the development of the city, which Parkenberger, just to, to note, called an ecology of the city. Um, this is the book uh, in its first publication in 1945. It ended up being a long, longer project that would continue until 69. Um, their work differed from Park and Burgess in that they sought to um, step away from abstraction and begin to depict a finer grain investigation of the dynamics of the community of the Black metropolis and the world around it. I won't go through this in detail, but to give you a sense. Part of their work also involved uncovering histories that were not really well understood or um, attended to by um, the institutions of white academia, which of course, um, parallel to the project of the Black Metropolis, um, other students of uh, Park and Burgess, Burgess would become the econ economists and the planners and the policy makers who um, institutionalize a regime of segregation. Here, uh, one example of these maps of um, redlined neighborhoods, which were the black neighborhoods in Chicago, where um, both the US federal government and local governments systematically um, regulated a form of disinvestment um, throughout the 20th century. So the legacy of Park and Burgess is both um, this attempt to um, foreground a new understanding of the city by Drake and Caton, and then this attempt to regulate it into segregated, segregated zones by race in order to um, enhance in government investment in white neighborhoods and um, extract resources from black neighborhoods. Um, this went on um, through a whole regime of reinvention and remaking of a number of these territories in the city in uh, the 1940s, Walter Gropius, Mies, part of it, um, uh, through a series of developments that would um, undo the fabric of the place called the Black Metropolis, so that by the 60s, this place called the Black Metropolis, so carefully documented by um, Drake and Caton, would largely be erased and replaced with large institutional um, uh, uh, modernist towers in empty land um, uh, where the um, networks of community had been erased. Throughout this story, um, Drake and Caton couldn't buy a house in Chicago. Um, local banks regulated by federal policy would not allow them to obtain a mortgage. Drake would then go on to found the first Department of African American Studies at Stanford and become a leader in um, articulating new approaches to understanding both American history um, and um, the African American future. What we're left, in part because American family household wealth is driven largely by real estate investment, by um, the possibilities that uh, home ownership provides in terms of wealth accumulation and um, affordable, like a housing at an affordable cost. Um, what we see, um, particularly over the period from 63 to now, is a widening of the gap of household wealth between um, white and um, black and brown families. The question becomes, um, what what is environmental justice 
in this kind of framework, particularly for those black communities where um, uh, even social capital have, has been dismantled uh, through this process of systematic disinvestment. Um, at Blacks and Green, um, we think of environmental um, justice as both an economic and an, uh, a, a liberatory project. Um, and so we seek to um, repair and regenerate um, the urban environment of a particular Black neighborhood through both economic and social justice means. I won't go through this in detail. Maybe we can speak about it in, in, in the discussion. Um, but it means sort of creating new systems of relation that bring new kinds of um, social, asset, social and environmental assets um, into relationship to each other. Uh, on the left, you see a map of our neighborhood. On the right, you see um, examples of the work we do. The secret to um, the approach in many ways is the scar, is the harm left behind by disinvestment. Both the green and gray territories in the map on the left are empty lots. Wow. are sites where buildings have been torn down or destroyed and through civil unrest and where which we seek to reoccupy through a variety of means the other um, resource that is part of, of the neighborhood and part of our work is the social capital which this neighborhood has generated through the process of survival uh, this is a um, a graphic from Brian Seeley, who runs the design firm Colorquay in New Orleans and leads an organization called Design as Protest. I think here in his sort of articulation of um, the uh, pathway from the status quo through liberation, what we see is this attempt to capture through time through perhaps uh, a nonlinear understanding of time, um, both recompense and affirmative influence, recompense for the past and affirmative influence in the future, um, which actually I think marks this effort um, that uh, Naomi Davis in particular has constructed through um, the life of the Blacks and Green organization. Here we are. Um, in Chicago right now, we are at the very um, southern point of the um, Black metropolis that uh, Drake and Caton so carefully mapped. And I want to end um, with this image of one of our current projects um, that I think illustrates this kind of collapsing of the past and present that is necessary to the work and that I think forms the core of its liberatory qualities. Uh, a slum lord owned this building, which was the place where Emmett Till and his mother lived in 1955. That was the year that Emmett visited his family in Mississippi and was murdered by two white men who mutilated his body beyond recognition. Um, Mamie, his mother, um, went to Mississippi as soon as she could because she knew that um, the chances were that uh, the white sort of uh, power structure in Mississippi would try to hide his body and keep it from view. Um, she brought the body back with her to Chicago and held um, a funeral that became a massive gathering of African Americans from around the US, a funeral where um, she gave everyone the opportunity to encounter um, Emmett's remains and a moment that became a kind of inflection point for the efforts uh, surrounding um, the civil rights movement in the U.S. 
Mamie would then go on living in this house to um, fuel the civil rights movement through the 50s and 60s, and then um, uh, through a relentless campaign of visiting churches, visiting um, schools, um, raising money for the NAACP's legal efforts to end the strictures and structures of segregation in cities like Chicago, which ultimately led to the passage of um, the Civil Rights Acts in 1965. So we're working to both preserve this house and to transform it into a net zero waste and energy um, building while uh, maintaining its integrity as an historic structure. Um, and uh, it will house a great migration living archive inside the building and around it, a green infrastructure that will manage um, rainwater and provide um, a little island of biodiversity in the neighborhood. This will be a demonstration project for similar rehabs of existing buildings throughout the neighborhood. And it is our hope that we can avoid displacement and um, both maintain and grow um, the social capital of the Black people who live in this neighborhood and have survived there throughout the history of Chicago. Thank you.